Decoding Learning Differences with Kimberlyn Lavelle, and this episode is The Right to Read with Dr. Katherine Garforth. So Dr. Katherine Garforth is an expert in reading. She has the Right to Read Initiative podcast, which I am in love with and definitely recommend that you enjoy as well. And she also has Garforth Education, where she supports parents and teachers in learning what they need to know to support their learners. So she has so much value and wisdom in this episode. I am really looking forward to you listening to this episode because you're going to get so much out of it. Be sure to li- to click below at some of the links um, that go to her website and all the things that she's doing, the supports that she's offering. They're a great resource, um, some incredible stuff. I, I'm really excited about all that she's got going on. And this conversation is one where, and I've said this in some other ones, this is another one where you need to listen multiple times. And maybe just to the sections that are applicable to your, the age of your child. So we kind of go through what to do to work on reading at various ages. So figure, so when you hear, okay, that's the beginning of this one, note what time it started so that you can go back. Um, I kind of ask about birth to two years old, but she really kind of pulls in zero to five in that whole section. And it's a long one. So pay attention to when does it start so you can go back and keep listening to that whole section again and again and again. Or if you have an older child, listen to that next section again and again and again. Um, and we go we go through um, basically until we just run out of time and have to end it. So there is so much that you are going to get out of this, so much that you can really take action on today, and probably a lot that you're going to be like, oh, I'm already doing that, and you can feel good about it. So you don't have to listen as carefully to that part. You're listening more carefully to the parts that you're not doing yet or that you could, could bring in and start doing. So enjoy. All right, so welcome to the podcast, Dr. Katherine Garforth. We are so excited to have you here today. I want to start by letting you kind of tell everyone about yourself, your own journey, what you're doing in the world, which I know is a lot, and then we'll kind of get into some other questions. Of course. So my name is Dr. Katherine Garforth. I live in Richmond, British Columbia, Canada, and I've had a long journey to literacy. Uh, starting as an individual with dyslexia myself, I did not learn how to read in the public school system. I had quite a traumatizing experience with emotional and physical abuse in the classroom and having the school being okay with me falling through the cracks, telling my parents that they should just give up on me. Um, and then I wouldn't graduate or make it to high school. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So it, uh, it was difficult, um, but I was very fortunate in having parents that knew that I could do better. And I was able to go to private school specializing in dyslexia, where I had one hour of Oregon Gillingham tutoring five days a week. And I went from a student who couldn't read to a student who could read. I went from a student that was failing math to a student that skipped a grade in math in less than one academic year. Wow. Uh, So it's, and that's the first school that I went to had a motto that was, if you can't learn the way we teach, we'll teach the way you learn. And that school was life-changing for me. Um, It it definitely helped boost my confidence, realize that I wasn't stupid or a waste of the teacher's time, which I was told repeatedly in my classroom by my teacher in front of all of my peers uh, at my my previous school. Um, And so I got to the point where I was able to be a reader and get through the material. So I went back to a public school that did not, or sorry, a private school not specializing in dyslexia uh, and made it through graduated I went to university and I got a bachelor's of computer science degree while I was there 
um, it was a school that, you know, at the time, you know, learning disabilities were just starting to come up and, you know, people with learning disabilities were just starting to go to university. So they didn't have a disability resource sense center at that point. Um, they had a, someone like an office, uh, and I helped develop the resource center. I joined the special needs advisory committee, which was a president's advisory committee at the university. So I was speaking with the deans and higher ups at the university about how we can make sure that their accessibility was there. Uh, I took part in some things with the Ontario Human Rights Commission and the Alberta Community of Citizens with Disability. I spoke to university professors about how to teach students with learning disabilities. And I uh, kind of developed a passion uh, even more. Um, and I guess in, in high school, I started working with other students with learning disabilities, helping them understand their disability and how to be successful and how to advocate and also speaking to their parents to help the parents understand their diagnosis, their child's diagnosis and what it meant. So after, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> there's, I did a lot. Um, so I was actually in a documentary in the late 90s on dyslexia and transitioning to high school, like having that successful transition from elementary to high school as a dyslexic student. Um, and then I was also in the um, Deciphering Dyslexia documentary that was put out by the Knowledge Network. Uh, in 2007, it went to International Meta Media Awards um, for the documentary and um, how it did well. So after I finished my computer science degree, I realized that, you know what, I, I, I'm much more wanting to make a difference for individuals of students that have a learning disability. So I decided to go into the field of education. I did my bachelor's degree and was very dissatisfied with the program and the approaches to teaching reading as an individual with dyslexia who struggled, who failed reading recovery uh, and several other different interventions uh, before I was actually taught to read. And I, I recognized that this was a damaging approach uh, to teaching students and that wasn't good enough for me. Um, so I continued on to my master's in educational psychology and special education with a specialization in learning disabilities. Uh, I know that's a mouthful, but it's the technical title uh, for what I did. Uh, and then I did a PhD as well, um, knowing that there was more to be done. Um, throughout my life, I was very fortunate because my mom was a very passionate and dedicated advocate and still is. She was the past president of the Edition, uh, International Dyslexia Association, British Columbia branch, and had some very influential people come to British Columbia, like Louisa Motes in the early 2000s, um, and Frank Wood. Uh, she was part of several uh, International Dyslexia Association conferences and had a, a very significant role in that. So having that as a role model, but realizing that the thing that always came back to her was, you're just a mom. You, you know, you don't have the training or the education, but I can promise you the amount of reading uh, and self-study that a parent does when they are determined to make sure that their child succeeds is a lot. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I got my PhD. And then actually just realizing the limitations of reality as being a dyslexic in academia, I decided that it wasn't the right place for me. Um, knowing that the publish or perish, so you have to read a lot of papers, do a lot of research and write a lot of papers. I love doing research. I love reading papers. I just not the greatest at writing them. So I created Garforth Education, which is my way of getting information out there to both parents and families about their child with a, um, neurodiversity, looking at ADHD, specific learning disabilities, and autism, helping them understand their child's needs 
and diagnoses, as well as learning how to advocate for them, especially in individualized education plans or IEP meetings, uh, and uh, also with 504 for those in the States. And I realized that we also need to do the same thing for teachers, knowing that teachers don't have the same knowledge that they could have that would really help them understand their students' needs and how best to meet them in the classroom. So I have got several courses uh, with Garforth Education, looking at reading development, executive functions, um, psychoeducational assessments, and individualized education plans. And these are all about giving teachers and parents the knowledge that I think is critical to understanding a, a student's needs and making sure that they are set up for success instead of being set up for failure. Um, and so I have the courses, I have online membership programs, I've got Facebook groups, <laughs> I've got a lot for that. And then uh, the beginning of this year, the Ontario Human Rights Commission published a report called the Right to Read Public Inquiry, and it came uh, with a multiple page report and 157 recommendations for how we can make a difference for students, making sure that all students have equitable access to reading instruction. And that is something that I am deeply passionate about. And we've had several reports and papers that have been really monumental over the years, but unfortunately the hype dies, dies down. And I decided it was my mission to make sure the hype didn't die down on this. And we kept it in the forefront and in the media, getting information out there for how we can make changes. Um, because right now it's a very much a grassroots movement. And it's the summertime here in the Northern Hemisphere. So I'm hoping to make a little bit of a grass fire out of that to try and be the impetus for change because every student has the right to read. Uh, yes, you know, it's important to acknowledge that there is a very, very small percentage of the human population that will not be readers because they do not have the cognitive capacity for it. If you cannot comprehend spoken or sign language, you cannot be a reader um, because if you can't comprehend language, you can't read it. Um, and that is acceptable, but we should be having, you know, 95 of our students reading. Yeah. And uh, it's doing what we can to get there. So after the Ontario Human Rights Commission Right to Read Public Inquiry came out, I started doing a bunch of lives uh, with some great people from across the globe, talking to them about some of the recommendations and how we can make successful changes from what most schools are still doing, which is like a balanced literacy approach to teaching reading, which only will get between 40 and 60% of students reading, depending on the stats you go with, um, to towards a more um, science of reading, structured literacy approach to reading where we can get 95% of our students reading or more depending on the studies that you look at. And my, I'm determined to make sure that we get more of our students reading uh, because it's how we can equalize things. And recognizing that the practices that a lot of um, teacher education programs are providing for their pre-service teachers are not sufficient. And also for in-service teachers, recognizing that they don't have the training that they need to understand this. So again, that's why I've created courses. I have a course called Reading Development Explained. That's for the teachers that look, they were trained in balanced literacy, this is what they know, but they want to figure out what they can do better. And that course takes them step by step through the process, giving them information about that. So the Right to Read initiative has a podcast and um, we have finished season one and uh, there were 70 some odd episodes. Season two is happening this summer. And in July, I did a symposium um called effective literacy practices for bc educators uh, and that is where uh, a group of educators in the province of british columbia which is where i live got together and did presentations we had myself dr linda siegel 
a school psychologist who's doing amazing work in um, smaller communities in, uh, in the north of the province. And she's also uh, a faculty at one of the education programs. We talked to, to a superintendent, uh, a district literacy coordinator. We had an amazing duo of kindergarten teachers present on how they're having amazing results with these students that are coming to their classrooms, not knowing the alphabet, right? And they come from very uh, at-risk backgrounds and they've, they're students that are, attendance is a very, very difficult thing. They're not attending all the time, but they're still getting the vast majority of these students to be reading by the end of kindergarten. It's amazing work. Uh, I had a wonderful presentation on using nonfiction texts for reading fluency and then looking at getting the biggest bang for your buck in the intermediate and high school years, especially looking at vocabulary and comprehension. And then we had a great question and answer session. Um, and then in August, I have, oh, what's it called? A, gr um, a group of four presenters from Alberta are talking about the changes that they've made. I have Dr. George Giorgio is speaking about his research and the curriculum that he's designed for Alberta, a superintendent, uh, a high, or sorry, a elementary school principal who's made amazing changes, Dr. Matthew Kierstead. He's had been in a couple episodes on the Right to Read Initiative podcast and how he's gone from having those literacy goals as school-wide goals to now he's at the point where it isn't, in it, like he does, it doesn't need to be a goal for the school, which I think is amazing. And just his approach. Then we have a, a teacher that's talking about the changes that she's made. So these are all great things that are happening in season two that will wrap up at the end of August. Season three, I'm really excited because I have Lynn Stone from Reading for Life, Spelling for Life. She's going to come on for four episodes. Oh, wow. um, and it's it's all about getting the information out there. So it's really exciting. And you know when I'm talking to teachers, I like to do hear their journey is the first episode and then see what they're actually doing in the classroom or their thoughts about things. So that's, I think, oh, also I am a mother. I have three children, two are neurodiverse. One is severely dyslexic and then the other has autism. I know this uh, as a parent, as a person, as an educator, as a researcher. So I, I've often joked that at some point I'm going to write a, a book called The Many Hats of a Dyslexic, um, just because of the various roles I've played as a dyslexic or for dyslexics in my lifetime. So much, so much in your lifetime already. I, it's amazing seeing all that you're doing and the podcast, the Right to Read um, Initiative podcast is such a great podcast. I've been recommending it to people because I really enjoy it, um, which is why I was so excited to have you on. So a lot of our focus on this podcast is directed more for the parents to listen and know what they can do. Yes. So I wanted to dig into what can parents do to support their child's reading development? And I kind of want to talk through it at at different stages of so course is there and what is there that parents can do in those very early years those first like so much like birth to like two three years old so much <laughs> um one of the things is talking to your child and not just talking to them like they're babies talking to them like they're adults because this is when their brain is programmed to learn language. The more that you can do, the better the vocabulary. And as I said, I have three children. And uh, it's been a really cool journey watching them develop on their different trajectories. And when my youngest, we just moved to a new house when she was about two and a half. And the garden was gorgeous. And there were hydrangeas and rhododendrons and everything like that. And so, you know, I, I talk about the flower by its name. And then one day she, she's very precocious, but one day she went out in the garden and said, Hey, granddad, this is my favorite flower. It's a hydrangea. And I'm just like, excuse me. <laughs> when I was your age, this was a flower and it was pretty. Yeah. 
And if we're lucky, you got the color right. Exactly. <laughs> but this, so that child was late to developing language. Um, and that's fine. Like there's, there's a developmental trajectory and some kids are early, some kids are late, but she was later and it took a long time to get her colors down and recognizing that, you know, in those early years, there's so much that you can pick up on. And I know you're exhausted and there are so many things on that list to do, but speaking to your child with real words, um, there are like three tiers of vocabulary development. And I'm just going to go through this very basic. So tier one words are those everyday words that kids are just going to pick up naturally from being in the environment. So those are like the nouns and the adjectives. So, you know, they're going to learn what a dog is and what run and happy and sad and ice cream. Those are words that they're going to learn just from exposure in everyday language. You're not going to have to have an effort as long as you're speaking to the child, they're going to learn these words, right? Tier two are more fancier words. They're the books that you find in fancy Nancy books, right? They are the more descriptive words, uh, a little bit more academic, and they are words that kids can learn if you use them. And it, the more that you use them, the better it is for them because they need to hear it in a variety of contexts to really understand the word. But my example, oh, and so then there's tier three words, which are the highly focused specialized words that don't really cross contexts very easily. But children at this age can learn these words, no problem. My nephew at three years old was a dinosaur aficionado. He could tell you all of the names, the different eras and periods and that sort of thing. And I'm sure that's not too surprising. You know, you know, you know, a three-year-old that has that topic that the, they love and they learn these really fancy words, no problem, super easy, just from reading the books, right? And hearing the, the TV shows or whatever. Right. So making sure that you give your student or your children the opportunity to have that language exposure is essential and it's free. It's just making that conscious effort to use it. It takes a little bit. The more you do it, the easier it is. And again, it's amazing conversations. And understanding how their little mind work just fascinates me. I love the preschool years. Like the, the zero to five are my favorite. Um, so having that vocabulary, reading books. Uh, my children, again, were a little bit atypical. They loved books from the get-go and they would sit for hours. Like they would just come, I'd sit on the couch and they'd bring me book after book after book. Now, the reason why books are so important is the language that is used in them isn't necessarily the stuff that we're going to see in everyday conversation. And the things that you can draw their attention to as you're reading, this is all stuff that we're doing to try and help prepare them for learning how to read and understanding what they read. So as a parent, you don't need to know the whole details about this theory, but it's helpful to understand. There's something called the simple view of reading, and it's boiling down understanding what you read into two essential concepts. So there is the word recognition. So when your child can actually read the word, that's a huge component. But equally important is their language comprehension. And those zero to five years, language comprehension is the area that you can focus on and getting them to understand the spoken language. The more that you can do this, the better, right? Uh, and reading aloud to your child, using audiobooks are great because I'd rather children listen to an audiobook in the car than watch something on the TV screen. Right. Uh, and if, if it's a practice that you get into, um, they're really engaged and activated in it, right? But it, it the best children's books, the classic ones, like I love Julia Donaldson, right? The Gruffalo, uh, Tiddler. Um, why am I drawing Steel a blank? Steel the Whale. Steel the Whale. Yeah. Room yeah. on the Broom. Yeah, yeah, we've got most of them. Yeah. <laughs> but the language uh, is amazing. Another great thing to do is playing with nursery rhymes and language 
And this is something that develops an essential skill called phonological awareness. And that's the awareness of spoken sound within a language. And again, this is a period that that's naturally developing. And we want to do everything that we can to help promote that development. If you are noticing any difficulties in understanding your child's speech, or if they're having difficulty pronouncing sounds at this point in their life, you want to go to the pediatrician, your doctor, or talk to your public health representative about getting them into um, getting their hearing screened, because this is a very common age for children to have earaches and some students need, or some children need tubes to help drain the fluid in their ears. That can make a huge difference in how they hear sounds, right? So that can impact their speech production. Now, if that isn't an issue, then looking about going to a speech and language pathologist. Now in Canada, under five, that's typically covered by um, the early childhood stuff. I'm not sure how it is in the States or if it's state dependent. Um, I think they can do it through medical, but there's also the school districts mm -hmm. cover it um, even before three. Yeah. So yeah, there's, yeah, it's definitely available. This is what we want. And we want them to learn about their articulation. So that's the, the shape that their mouth makes when they're making the sounds. These are compulsory skills for learning how to read. They have to be able to distinguish and hear the differences between the sounds in the language in order to associate them with the letters. Uh, and the more that you can do this, the better. When you're doing reading, yes, there's going to be times where you're just reading the book. You're like, okay, it's done. Go to bed. But there are also times when you want to have those conversations about the book and point out different features. Did you notice how, um, let me think, uh, um, oh, help. Oh, no, the Gruffalo, right? Pay attention to those rhymes. Ask them about the pictures that they're seeing in the book. Ask them, uh, we have the Gruffalo Touch and Feel book. Oh. And it has talking about his eyes are orange oh his eyes are orange where are his eyes where are your eyes what color are your eyes right his tongue is black oh, let's see your tongue can i see your tongue he has purple prickles all over his back and then so that, like it's just getting them engaged and actively involved and having fun and again that's just quality time with your child that you can't replace and it's those moments, even like you have a million things, you got to make dinner, you got to clean the house. Tell yourself 10 minutes with that active engagement of reading with your child is actually going to make it so they're happier because they're getting their emotional bucket filled and they're getting a lot of learning and interaction engagement that's going to have them more satisfied. So when you put them down, they're going to leave you alone a little bit more than if you didn't. So take that minutes because realize it's going to save you half an hour. Yes. Yes. But also draw their attention to the letters. You know, I love alphabet books and talking about, oh, A says, ah, and you know what? These letters, we put them together to make words. These are all concepts about print and, you know, hold the book upside down and try and read it backwards. <laughs> see what the, what, see what your child does and say, oh, well, what's wrong with this? Oh my goodness. It's not working. And try and highlight these concepts that you take for granted, especially if learning to read wasn't difficult for you. So as I said before, I have three children. I have a child that has severe dyslexia and loves literacy, has always loved books. I have read thousands and thousands and thousands of books to that child before they entered school. Still dyslexic. So it had nothing to do with the fact that that child did not spend hours on our lap listening to stories, we actually started reading them novels at 10 months old. So, um, and they loved it. They have amazing vocabulary, but still dyslexic. There's that genetic component, right? That, um, and then I have another child that learned how to read before kindergarten. And it happens. It's a very small percentage of the population, but with the right exposure at home and the right stuff that you do with your child, they can pick it up fairly easily. Now that's about five, maybe 10% of the population. And anything that you can do to help them with that is great. 
another thing that, you know, I do, I'm, I'm a bit of a word nerd. <laughs> um, and because I know this stuff well, but play with nursery rhymes in the car and, you know, use your child's where they're at, instead of looking to a, a program saying, okay, at this age, they need to be here. So start trying to think of words that start with the same sound or end with the same sound, counting syllables, um, and then seeing, you know, can we break them? Can we really stretch out those sounds and go, k, a, t, right? Break it into individual phonemes, which are the speech sounds that make up language. Now, these are something that we have an unconscious awareness of if we can comprehend spoken language, right? So you can hear the difference between sat and sit. You can hear it. And, you know, as an adult who is reading or is a reader, you can understand, oh, yeah, it's because the A and the I make different vowel sounds. But to a child that hasn't been taught about the letters and the sounds, they can still tell you that there's a difference between sat and sit. They just don't know what. When we start teaching reading, we're trying to bring that unconscious awareness to the conscious awareness. So anything that we can do to help promote the development is excellent, right? So there are lots of resources online. Um, anything that you can do with nursery rhymes is things that we want to help these kids, help them prepare them. So playing with language, as much book exposure as you can. If you are not a reader or a poor reader and are self-conscious about it, get audiobooks. Most libraries have free apps that you can get for audiobooks. They have them available as cassette tapes and as CD-ROM or a, like a CD. So you can listen to them if you don't have a phone. Online access, you can listen to them. Uh, they have amazing readers on YouTube reading books like The Gruffalo. Um, oh, what's his name? There's this guy that wraps the uh, Dr. Seuss books. And it is incredible. And he does it with like Dr. Dre in the background. I can't think of his name right now. I've seen that, but I can't remember either. Uh, but those are amazing. And our kids love it. Uh, there are fun books, you know, the book with no pictures. And you're like, kids, you know, a, a three-year-old's not going to like this. But yes, it is because there's all sorts of silly words and um, all sorts of things like that. And then there is, so another book that's great is, did you take the B from my ook? Not me. So this is a, a great book. Hello, do you have favorite things? I have favorite things. They are bats and beaches and bread and bushes and bulldozers. They are my favorite because they all start with the letter B. The letter B can make sounds too. Can you say bub, 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 bub? Can you say bub, 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 bub? Can you say brr? Yes, it's a bit cold in here, isn't it? Oh dear, I think I'm going to. Ah, choo! I think I'm catching a cold. Excuse me. Now, where were we? Oh, yes. My favorite things. Here are a few more. I love my Ed. It's the best Ed in the whole world. What? My what? Yeah, that's what I said. Am I saying it wrong? And I like every size of all. Hmm, that didn't sound right. Let me try again. I love O's, small O's and big O's. So, I mean, they're, they're books like this that are funny and engaging and kids, kids really get a kick out of them. Especially the, the preschoolers. They're like, hey, no, I don't know. And the more expressive that you can be, the better. Um, so again, that's, did you take the B away from my ook by back? Oops. Sorry about that. Beck and Mac Stanton. So I love that. That's that's awesome. I, yeah. I'm gonna have to look at that one. I haven't seen that one. Yeah. And it's this a series called series called Drive Kids Crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, the more that you can do early on, it's gonna pay off dividends in return. And Anything that you can do to help vocabulary development is huge. Vocabulary in kindergarten is a huge predictor of 
later success in reading comprehension, and so is phonemic and phonological awareness, which is the awareness of speech sounds. So these are free things that you can do at home to make a big difference for your child, right? Library cards are free. You can take out books from the library for free. You don't need to have a library of a thousand books in your house to have enough literacy exposure for your child. You can go to the library and pick out a few books every week. Um, you, there's the eBooks. Anything that you can do to help support their exposure to language is essential. Yes. There's so much there that is so, so amazing. Um, and also I should mention that you can screen students at the age of four for risk for reading failure. Um, luckily in the United States, you have a lot of that happening. There are free programs um, that they can do on like half an hour on an iPad and you can see what areas they're at risk for. Now, this does not mean that we are diagnosing children at three and four years old with a learning disability. We're saying, hey, look, these are areas that they're weak in that are associated with students struggling later on in life. But if we can target these skills early and get them to where they need to be before they begin reading, it's going to make things so much better for them. It's going to save you thousands and thousands of dollars in tutoring. It's going to save you hours and hours of heartbreak and social emotional trauma that your child may never recover from. Now, this isn't to guilt you if you have a child that has a learning disability and you weren't able to do this. Uh, earlier on, it's still very much a new thing. It's not standardized across states. We're starting to see that. It's not standard across standardized across Canada. Teachers don't know a lot about this yet, um, but we need to make the change so that they do, and we can help students before they fall. Yeah, yeah, that is that is perfect. Um, I see parents who don't know you know, haven't done a lot of research or whatever, their initial thing is they want their child to know their ABCs and like, that's all their focus. So what is your take on that? It's not going to hurt. <laughs> I'm not going to say don't teach your child the alphabet. Don't work on those fine motor skills to help them learn how to draw their letters, learning about recognizing their name. Um, but don't give them flashcards to memorize how words are spelled because that's not how we actually teach reading effectively. Right. We want to give them the skills. We want to teach them to catch the fish instead of just giving them the fish. Right. So I do have a course called a parent's guide to reading development that goes through this step by step for parents so they can understand how to do it. Uh, or even if you're a little bit more savvy and wanting to get the deeper explanation, there is reading development explained that goes into that deeper detail. But it gives you the activities that you can use uh, to help your your child learn the skills that they need to do. And, you know, there's great online resources and, you know, there's the learning books that you could, kids can learn how to draw letters and shapes and, you know, playing with Play-Doh is essential, right? Coloring is essential, not on the iPad. <laughs> they need to get those fine motor skills, which is something, you know, that's going to give them the pen control. And honestly, I hear so many parents say, oh, they're really good with Lego. The problem is with Lego, you're just pinching. And that's not going to help you with the small muscles that you need to do the circles and for the letter formation. So we want to give them the opportunity to develop those muscles uh, in play. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it feels like we could just spend all day talking just about the beginning. But let's move on to... Uh, so when you were talking about that, you included some things with preschoolers. Is there anything else for preschoolers or was that all covered in there? Um, I think covered a lot. We're okay. talking about like if the fine motor skill development, yeah. the vocabulary development, the awareness of the different sounds in the language, helping yeah. them learn about letters, talking about, you know, teaching your kid how to spell their name is not going to hurt them. Right. If that's something that they learn from memory at the beginning, that's okay. Right. right. You know, this is your name because it's spelled K-A-T-H-R-Y-N. Look, this is a K. It's a big stick and then a short line and a short line. Right. It is just stuff that 
we want them to learn and know because it's something that they're going to be expected to know when they get to school, even before they have had the instruction to teach it. They're going to have to learn how to print their name on a page so teachers understand or whose page is from who, right? right? So whatever we can do to help that is great. And a lot of kids just learn how to recognize it just through exposure, especially if they're in daycare or preschool settings where their name is on everything. They learn to recognize it by giving them more information instead of just memorizing it as a logo. Yeah. Right. You know, right. they, before they can read, read McDonald's anywhere, as long as they've had an ex enough exposure to McDonald's, they know that the big golden arch. Yeah. The letters underneath is McDonald's. Right. Right. Okay. So then our child is in kindergarten, first grade, the early years of schooling. What should parents be doing to support their reading at that point? Well, they should be asking the school for progress monitoring and benchmark screening, right? A lot of the states have this within their mandates. They have to do screening and uh, benchmark assessments two or three times throughout the year. You want to know what those results are and you want to recognize what's happening with your child. Home reading is only effective if you're doing it right. Um, there is a great YouTube video. I can't remember the exact name, but it's about the color purple or something. And it's this teacher or this educator that's getting their child to read one of the leveled texts that they brought home in their home reading. And so they were reading through it and she did a great job. She can do it no problem. But then the mother wanted to see if they could read them out of context, the words, but they couldn't because the pictures weren't there and they didn't, they didn't know why. So you may be sent home these leveled texts that have great illustrations or predictable It's a repeatable pattern. Well, that doesn't mean that your child is actually reading they may figure it out but may is not good enough to me right so you want to make sure that they have the skills now i'm not expecting every parent out there to go and get a bachelor's of education and learn about the science of reading and how we put letters together and make them work but it is something that you can hold your school responsible for doing and ask questions ask hard questions if it's not working out saying look my kid doesn't know their letters my kid doesn't know how to blend words together. Uh, another thing that I, I, I really find interesting is asking a child, once they've learned how to print their alphabet, to sit down, print their name, and print their alphabet. See how long it takes. Do they miss, mix up lowercase and uppercase letters? Do they know the difference between them? How long does it take them to write it, right? One of these things that's really important is developing automaticity. So your child doesn't have to think about doing things. I'm hoping that as an adult, you are at the point where you can print your name or write your name without thinking about it. You're not thinking, okay, what's the first letter? How do I make that letter? Okay, so first I go down and then I go, like, you want it to be automatic so they're, they're not even thinking about it. And you can, like, sign your autograph on books, no problem, while having a conversation. And it's not, like, it may not be pretty because it's not following a straight line because you're not paying attention to it. But you can do it. We want to make sure that our, our children develop to automaticity for printing. Yes, there are computers. Yes, typing and electronics are the future. But actually, physically printing is an essential skill that they need because you don't have a charger everywhere you go, right? And we also want to get that letter recognition up to automaticity. So they're not having to stop and think, okay, is that a C? Mm, yeah, I think so. It, it's got the curve. You want to like, oh yeah, seek, right? You want to develop that again to automaticity. So they know the names of the letters of the alphabet and they know the sounds that the letters represent, right? Those are things that you can work on. and. I believe that all schools should have a scope and sequence and the parents should understand what that scope and sequence is. What I mean by that is we're not teaching the children the alphabet starting at A and ending at Z and having those 26 letters, those 26 sounds, and then we're done with phonics instructions. That's not effective. That's not the best way to do it. We want to have a logic to how we're teaching the letters. If you teach the first six letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, there are only a handful of words 
that are simple enough for children to sound out when they're just learning how to read that are meaningful words to them, that they're actually going to understand and have as part of their vocabulary. However, if we have a defined scope and sequence where we're teaching letters that are most commonly used and those small C, D, C, or consonant, vowel, consonant, short little one syllable words that kids can decode, if you're very strategic about that, then you can have them, if you teach S, A, T, P, I, N as the first six letters that you're teaching them how to read, there are over 40 words that are part of your child's vocabulary already that they will be able to read and recognize. And there are things called decodable texts that are written so that they can read those in a, in a story. I mean, they're not the most exciting stories in the world, but they're actually reading the words and it's giving them the opportunity to decode or sound out the word and put those sounds together to make the word. And doing that repeatedly is gonna give them the opportunity to orthographically map. Now, again, that's not a word that I expect to be. It's part of your vocabulary, but what it means is at a point where you can recognize it within a fraction of a second and you can't even help but read it. You're not sounding it out. You see it. And like right now I'm, you know, I'm talking to you on Zoom and I see mute on my screen and I know it's mute. I cannot not read it as mute. If I sounded it out, it would take me longer to figure it out than just looking at it. So we want to develop that automaticity so the kids can fluently read text, right? Because that's going to give us some of the skills that we need to get so they can understand what they're reading. So if we are giving students a proper scope and sequence, then they're going to be able to read more words faster and have the skills to move forward. The other thing, the, the really tricky thing about the English language is that our alphabet doesn't line up with our sounds very well, unfortunately, right? So there are 44 phonemes in the English language, depending on dialect. In some areas, there are fewer. In others, there are 44. Now, those are the individual speech sounds within the English language. There are 20 consonant sounds, and there are 24 vowel sounds. We've got 26 letters. So that means that the letters have to do double duties. And there are some times when we put two and three letters together to represent one sound. Those are referred to as digraphs and trigraphs. You know them, but you may not realize it. So TH doesn't say T, H. This is Z or TH, right? So we want to explicitly, so directly teach our kids that TH isn't T, H, it's or Z, right? They learn that it's going to save them a lot of grief when they're trying to sound out words because they recognize that TH is and then they can sound out that as ah, that, right? So we want, and the other one that most people don't recognize or realize that is actually a digraph is NG. It's not mm, g, it's mm, it's one phoneme, it's one articulatory gesture. So you make one shape in your mouth and you have one puff of air creating that, right? You don't have to change your sh the shape of your mouth. And so understanding these and teaching them in a uh, logical process means that we're giving our students the skills. So teaching TH and NG before we teach letters like X or Q, in my opinion, is much more effective because the word the comes up so much. And sing, ring, bring, thing, those are words that your child's gonna read repeatedly before they read words like queen. You know, maybe fox and box are pretty common, but it's giving them the skills that they need to be successful. And making sure that while you're doing this, you're not just getting them to read the words, you're getting them to spell the words. So if they have the knowledge to read the words, they should have the knowledge to spell the words, especially if it is a decodable word. And by that, I mean words that have a uh, one-to-one -one correspondence between letters and sounds. So if they know how to read the word sat, at, they should be able to write the word sat, at, <coughs> and figure out the grapheme phoneme or the letter sound relationships between the letters so they, they can write it. And we want to make sure that this is happening at the same time that we're teaching the reading to really help cement that word in their sight word vocabulary, which is the words that they can read automatically, right? and they recognize that spelling and the word are associated together in their memory. 
so that they can read it and spell it and use it and go to town. Now, there is the issue with quote unquote sight words. Okay. And these are words that you don't, can't necessarily sound out easily, like the word said. Well, technically speaking, sight word isn't the appropriate term for that because academically, we consider a word to be in the sight word vocabulary or a sight word, one that they recognize within that fraction of a second. That's really what a sight word is referring to. But over the years, we've called them sight words because we want kids to memorize them. Problem is that's not going to give them the skills that they need um, to do that. So there's a really great method of teaching words called heart words. And that's where we're looking at teaching the kids the words that you can sound out in the words and highlighting the, the letter or letters that are a little bit tricky. When we do this, it is a much more logical process and it helps the child map the words so they can have that automatic recommendation or recognition of the word and help them spelling the words at the same time. This is better for them to understand than just saying, oh, well, it's just spelled that way because it is. Uh, the English language and writing system actually has a lot more logic to it than you think. Um, and again, I don't expect you to become an expert in it, but realize there is a reason for the vast majority of spellings in the English language if you care to find it out. So the English language, and again, this is another like jargony term, is a morphophonemic language. That means that our language and our spelling system is based on morphemes and phonemes. We've already talked about phonemes. Those are the individual speech sounds of the language. But that comes after morphemes. And morphemes relate to meaning, prefixes, suffixes, roots, and also, the, the other thing that comes into play is etymology, so where the word comes from. So there are parts of words, the smallest part of word that conveys a meaning is a morpheme. That can be a prefix like pre or un. It can be a, word, a root word or a base element. Uh, and a base element can be a, a free base, which is a word like run or cat. So something that can be by itself. Or it can be something that is not able to stand alone. You have to affix it or attach another morpheme to it, right? So when we learn about morphology, which is the study of this stuff and learning what they mean, it gives us a better understanding of language and how to read words and how to spell words. One morpheme that is really useful to teach later on is the I-O-N morpheme, right? It's a suffix. And when you're sounding out a word like television, it's not e r n. It's <laughs> so it's it's giving a method to the madness. The other part that's helpful in this is looking at etymology and where the word comes from because that helps us understand the vowel spelling patterns in it and some of the weird spellings for sounds. Like for example. Do you know why we use PH to represent the sound in writing? No? Well, um, PH is how the Greeks, when, when we look back to the Greek alphabet, there was not a letter to represent the F, right? F was not part of the Greek alphabet. We use the Roman alphabet. Romans came after Greeks. So the Greeks used PH. And that's why we use pH. And how do you know if a, a word has that pH? Well, if it has a, a Greek or a, a morpheme in it, a Greek morpheme in it. It's one of those jargon words. It's one of those technical terms. The, the academic language is often based on Greek and Latin roots. Well, think about telephone. Well, phone is a morpheme. The pH makes the th sound as with um graphic okay right. oh or that's good yeah. yeah well i was thinking photograph it's got, it's got at the beginning and end yeah it can become my beginning it can become the end yeah. but understanding that and the reason why uh if you've ever watched a spelling bee and you, you have kids saying uh can i get the origin of the word the reason they ask this is because it helps them understand how to spell the sounds in a word that they don't know right and that's how they become 
proficient spellers and readers. It gives them the skills that they know they need to know to understand what they're trying to read. So if we look at morphology, which is the study of the meaning parts of words, and we look at phonology, which is the individual speech sounds, and we look at etymology, which is the history of the language. And, you know, there, there are simple things like understanding that the reason because there's an, an E at the end of come is because to show the relationship between came, because they're related words. So the E signifies the relationship. And, you know, why does, why is there always a E after the end, uh, after a V in the final syllable in the English language? It doesn't always make the vowel say it's long sound, like in love or in have. It's because in English, it is not allowed to have V ending the word. So they have the E. These are all things that, again, Take a little bit of time to learn. It's not something that I expect parents to go out to learn, but it is actually quite fascinating and kids figure it out. And there's a great book called Uncovering the Logic of English. And it's according to um, Kindle, it's about a four and a half hour read. And it lays this out for you so clearly and the rules and the associations. And if we are able to give our children the understanding of why, it's so much better than saying just because, right? Uh, so that's that's what I see. And that's that's what I feel is especially important when we have these kids that don't understand. So in those kindergarten, one, two, three years, we want to make sure that our children are getting the support that they need to develop the skills. The most effective time for intervention for students that are struggling with reading is in the K-1-2 years. The time increases exponentially as you go further down the road. That does not mean that a student who is in the upper grades cannot learn to read or should not learn to read. It means that if you have a child in those first few grades and you think they're struggling, don't waste time, get help right away. It's not because they are a late baby. It's not because they've missed time at school. I mean, technically it might be, but we wanna make sure that you are doing everything in your power to get your child the skills that they need to do better because this is when you're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck, see the most improvement and go forward. Now, if your child is struggling, the other thing is to make sure that they have positive exposures to text where it's not always working with them on reading. They need to have the time to have the pleasure of reading where you are reading to them or they're having audiobooks because this is going to give them access to the language that they can't read on their own. So it's going to help them expand their vocabulary development. I highly recommend audiobooks. Again, uh, reading to your child. I think parents should read to their child from birth to the day they walk out the door. Uh, because the conversations that you can have and you can read above their reading level and it is just that special bonding moment between you and your child. And it can bring up awkward conversations, especially in the teenage years, right? When you're talking about, you know, relationships and the different challenges of teenagehood. If it comes up in a book, it's easier to discuss than everyday conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There, yeah, again, so many beautiful things. Um, I just want to see if there was something I wanted. Part of it was you did, you mentioned the, the sight words thing. Like mm. a lot of times they're still sending home like a list yep. of yep. words that, you know, or the set of flashcards here, go practice yep. these. So if a parent is receiving those. Yeah. From what I've seen, it seems to me like the heart words is something that they could implement themselves. There are free videos online that you can look up, look up heart work magic, get your kid to watch them, talk about them, do them at home, even if they're not doing it in school, this is going to get it. So it's not just memorized for a test, right? They actually understand it. They're going to be able to spell it. It's going to give them a method to the madness of the English spelling system. Yeah. The other thing I've noticed is there's kids who they'll memorize the word on that card. 
in that font on that piece of paper exactly that way and then but it's not generalized right so it's not actually there it's, it's like they know the name of that picture really not that word um it isn't that orthographic mapping that i discussed right. earlier right so they have memorized it as a logo yeah right so if you see um the burger king sign and even if the word the letters aren't correct like if it's like booger king you won't notice it unless you actually stop and actually look at the letters and go through them letter by letter right. you're just recognizing the logo and assuming that it is spelled correctly right um so if you're training them to on that card know it exactly that way it's like you're asking them to memorize an icon and if, unless it's in that situation in that font exactly how it looks they're not going to transfer it to another situation right and that's not helpful for anyone that's yeah. not efficient use of time uh and the more that we can do to get it so that they learn this and learn it well the better and taking them back to the base so and i guess this is probably more for um maybe the next age group but when you have a child that is struggling with learning how to read you need to identify where they are struggling there are so many different interventions out there and they are pricey right. it takes time away from you it takes finances i mean there are parents that go into significant amount of debts take out second mortgages max out their credit cards to try and get their child to read which is a basic human right according to the united nations and in a first world country, uh, this shouldn't be an issue, right? This shouldn't be the responsibility of the parents to afford and make sure it happens. Unfortunately, it's the case that we are currently in. So we need to make it so that you are getting the biggest bang for your buck because it's a lot of time driving your child to the intervention, the money and the finances. So you want to make sure that the skills that are being targeted in the intervention, whether it is something that you are doing privately or at the school, are actually targeting the skills that your child needs to work on and doing it in an effective manner that is based on research best practices. Writing words in shaving cream is not going to help them learn how to spell the word. It's fun. And they might learn a little bit, but there are better things that they can do with their time than writing words in shaving cream and making things out of sand right it, it is a tool that can be used as part of a program but it's not going to teach them how to spell the word they need to learn the basics so if your child is struggling with phonics and word recognition we don't need to be work focusing our intervention on reading comprehension right right we need to make sure they have the basic phonics skills before we teach them the complex phonics skills so what if you are looking to get your child support outside of school, you want to make sure that the person has appropriate certification to know that they, or a, a track record, right? Because a lot of these training programs are super expensive and they may have learned it on their own, which is fine. As long as they can prove that they know what they're doing, they have a plan of attack uh, and it's in a set in a logical order that's going to teach the first skills first and worry about the other stuff later on when it's important. Now, this can take time. There are some students that are going to have, you know, 20 hours and get it, right? But there's that range of students. There are students who need to see the same word thousands of times before they've actually orthographically mapped it. It is incredibly frustrating. It is incredibly challenging and repetitive, but it's what they need. And if that's what your child needs, you need to make sure this is what they get. Yeah. As an individual with severe dyslexia, that's what I needed. I needed to read a word thousands of times before I orthographically mapped it. Obviously, it can be done. I have a PhD. Not everyone is going to get a PhD, but it can be done with the right training, the right support, and the right intervention. Now, you don't want to just have the schools, oh, you know what? Here's voice to text. Uh, so you don't need to worry about spelling. You can just dictate it. Well, that, you don't always have that. And the school's not going to provide it for your child after they have graduated or if they drop out, right? Oh, here's an audiobook. Well, that's not going to help my child at a restaurant 
when they're trying to read the menu with their friends. They don't want to pull out uh, Speechify on their phone and have the menu read to them. That's embarrassing. I don't care what you think. It's embarrassing. You can't tell me that that's going to give the child the skills that they need. And research is showing us that the long-term damage and, you know, the people that there's a huge correlation between drug addiction, uh, homelessness, dropout, suicide, and students with learning disabilities. And I'm not trying to tell you this to scare you. I'm trying to tell it to you, or I'm telling you so you realize the long-term impact. So anything that we can do to help is better. And your school just saying, okay, well, here's an iPad or here's a, you know, here's a tablet. So things can be read to you and you can dictate them. That's not teaching the skills. That's giving them the tools to succeed, but we still need the intervention as part of the course. Now, it's great if you are in a position to do the training yourself and provide it for your child. But I do want to warn you that even though you may have the training, you may have the ability to do it, you may not be the best person for the job for your child. I personally pay for intervention for my children because I am more concerned about having the mother-child relationship with my child than the, the teacher-student. I want my child to be able to be vulnerable and come to me when they have problems and be able to not try and impress me all the time. And I know the friction that it causes between a parent-child relationship and how damaging that can be for their relationship, especially in the teenage years. So if you are able to work with your child, great. If it doesn't work out, don't think you're alone and it's a problem with you. Unfortunately, it's something that you're going to need to get that outside support. A lot of the private schools that specialize in learning disability started out because parents went to get the training to support their kids. It didn't go with their, well with their kids. So they started swapping kids. Okay, I'll tutor your kid for an hour while you tutor mine so they can get the support that they need, but I don't have to do it with my kid. I can be tutor, not mom. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Well, we are just about out of time. I feel like this has gone, I think, so much deeper than I was even expecting. And I, I should have expected it because I know that there is so much to it. Um, but I love all of it. And I think our listeners are going to have to listen again and again and again um, to, to get all those little bits that are so valuable, you know, like every two seconds, there's like, oh yeah, you need to, to think about this and think about that. So there's so much to it. Um, and thank you so much for your time. I will definitely be linking to your website, the Garforth Education, as well as to the Right to Read Initiative, both of those sites. Um, and, uh, and I'll specifically also link to those courses that you mentioned for the, the teachers and the, the, well, I'll link to the parent one because that's um, the majority of our listeners are parents. So, and then they can find the other one pretty easily. Anyway. Well, and, and the, the courses like, is not just teaching the skills, it's giving them the tools to do them. So I actually have videos of me doing some of the activities with my own children. So you can see what I'm doing and how I use these activities to help develop these skills. And it, it does have stuff that's going to help the preschooler all the way up to the, you know, the struggling reader in high school and things that you can do to go above and beyond. Yeah, it sounds so great. I, I, uh, I look forward to everyone taking advantage of that. Amazing and I, I should mention uh, that if you do have a child with a psychoeducational assessment and there is language that you don't understand it in it, I do have a YouTube channel called Psych Ed Terms Explained, where I go through those terms in layman terms so you can understand what it actually means for your child. Yeah. Because working memory is extremely important, but if you don't understand it, what's it going to tell you if your child's low? Right. But I can tell you that it's going to have a huge impact on their learning. Right. 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 Yeah. I, I saw that there too. Um, your website's very easy to navigate. So yeah, everyone will find it, but I'll also, I'll put that link in there too, just to make sure they see that. Cause I do think that's a very valuable resource for everyone. Thank you. Thank you for all that you were doing in the world. It has been amazing. And thank you so much for being on today. No problem.